These particular stories that I've chosen to tell are not my usual fare, by which I mean I did not invent them. They each came to me by diverse means, but they all have one thing in common. They were first told to me by someone else, whether in writing or by word of mouth, and they all, so I was told, are true. If they are true, they are singularly curious. Indeed, some of the most curious and intriguing stories I've ever heard. And I hope you will agree. The first I shall call The Squire's Story. Nine years ago, in 1849, the little town of Barford... Uh, not far from us here in Cranford, Miss Pratt. No, indeed. The town of Barford was thrown into a state of great excitement by the intelligence that a mysterious gentleman by the name of Mr Higgins... A gentleman? Oh. ...had been looking at the White House... Mr. Clavering's former residence. Oh, now, he was a gentleman. Dear old Mr. Clavering. You must understand that the White House and its former owner held a special place in the hearts of the people of Barford. Not only was it the largest house in the town, and therefore one of which they were very proud, but it was a house where townspeople and country people had often met at Mr. Clavering's friendly dinners. Though, if he had a fault, it was the love he had for those horses of his. Oh, you should see the improvements he made to the stables. They lived in high luxury, those beasts, while Mrs. Clavering had to make do with the perkiest sitting room you ever saw. Of course, we are in hunting country, Miss Pratt, and the gentry oh, must, must have, have their, their sport. sport. Yes, I know, Mrs. Gaskell. And indeed, he was true gentry, was Mr. Clavering. Oh, so gracious in his manners. Do you know, he actually bowed to me once in the street. Mm. Oh, I was most gratified, mm -hmm. for the parson's wife was looking out at the time. But the tragedy was that Mr Clavering, in 1849, departed back to Northumberland, taking his dinners with him. Leaving the White House empty, though not, unfortunately, for long. Well, Jones, I'm impressed, most impressed. It's all, well, very capacious. <laughs> the cupboard is very large. You'll find Mr Higgins, sir. And the stabling. Allow me to show you the accommodation for the horses. You suspected Mr Higgins from the very beginning, did you not, Miss Brown? I did indeed. You see, I know the estate clerk, Mr Jones... He's married to the daughter of a dear friend of mine, and it was he who showed Mr Higgins round the house. By Jove, these stables are a sight to behold, Jones. They look like a Roman emperor's built them. You know, perhaps we'll move in here and let the horses have the house. <laughs> <laughs> and what was Mr Jones's opinion of him? Well, uh, you must understand, uh, Mr Jones is not a man of discernment, Mrs Gaskell. For instance, he was unduly impressed by the friends Mr Higgins seemed to have. By God! Lord Bedford should see this. Oh. He's just refurbishing his stables, you know, but it ain't nothing like this. But, name-dropping Mrs Gaskell, anyone can do that. And the fact he seemed to carry a purse full of money on him, uh, Mr Jones was bowled over by that, you see. There he is. You taking this place, sir? Uh, do you want any help with your horses? We'll do it for you, sir. Ah, <laughs> well, I'll know where to look if I do. Here. There's money for you. Scramble for it, lads, that's the way. And if you come this afternoon at three to the George, I'll throw you out some more. All right! But there was something Mr Higgins said that took Mr Jones aback, or, as he put it, was not quite in line with a gentleman. I'm going to have some fun with those lads, Jones. Before they come, I'll make the money so hot in the fire shovel they'll howl when they pick it up. Tell you what... Come and dine with me at two and you'll be there to see it. I'll have made up my mind about the house, too, by that time. Oh. 
But Barford was not so quick to make up its mind about Mr. Robinson Higgins and who he could be. In fact, the uneasy wondering continued long after Mr. Higgins, Mr. Higgins's servants, and Mr. Higgins's stud had taken possession of the White House. In direct proportion, of course, to the degree of perception inherent in each person's character. Whoa! Oh, oh my God! A famous run, sir. Uh, the first time you've hunted in our county, I believe. Uh, but I hope we shall see you often. I hope to become a member of the hunt, sir. Oh, most happy. Proud, I'm sure, to receive so daring a rider among us. <laughs> you, you even jumped the cropped gate, I fancy, <laughs> while some of our friends here... Uh. Oh, oh, cowards, a lot of them. Oh, uh, allow me to introduce myself. Uh, Sir Harry Manley, Master of the Hunt. Oh, pleased to meet you. My name's Higgins. I'm only lately come to occupy the White House at Barford, oh. and I've not as yet presented my letters of introduction. Oh, hang it. A man with a seat like yours oh. might ride to any door in the county and be welcome. Uh, Mr. Higgins, uh, I shall be proud to become better acquainted with you over my dinner table. Fill every glass for wine inspires us and fires us with courage, love and joy. Now, I'm not a snob, Mrs. Gaskell. You know I'm not. But did you hear what he did to the walls inside the White House? I confess, Miss Pratt, I did not. Well, I know the kitchen maid's mother very well, and she told me that it looked like a fairground. He'd had the walls, uh, they were once a very dignified slate colour, he'd had them painted pink, and the mouldings had been picked out in gold. Can you imagine? But the chimney was at last repaired. And those lovely old-fashioned banisters in the hall were replaced by gilt ones. Oh, so common. And he was very popular with the local hunt. Well, yes. He inveigled his way in there with no difficulty whatsoever. Is on earth desirous? Fill every glass. For wine inspires us and fires us with courage, love and joy. You have a fine pair of lungs on you, Higgins. Uh, this calls for a toast. Gentlemen, to Mr. Higgins, our new neighbour. Mr. Higgins. Mr. Higgins! And it must be said, Mr. Higgins knew pretty well how to improve the acquaintance thus begun. Not only could he sing, but also tell a good story, and was well up in practical jokes. By the end of 12 months, Mr. Robinson Higgins was out and out the most popular member of the Barford Hunt. As Sir Harry was observing one evening at the dinner table of an old hunting squire in the neighbourhood. <coughs> Do you know? Oh, well, past the port, old chap. He's beaten all of us. By a couple of lengths, at least. Ah. Uh. So, you think he's all right, do you, Harry? Mm. You see, I mean, this young spark is looking sweet upon McCatherine, and she's a good girl, and will have £10,000 down the day she's married by her mother's will, and... Well, you must excuse me, Harry, for saying so, but I shouldn't like the girl to throw herself away. My good squire, a better fellow never existed. If I had 20 daughters, Higgins should have the pick of them. Oh, <laughs> Never thinking to ask the grounds for his old friend's opinion, Squire Hearn was not a doubter by nature, the old man was able to totter with an easy mind, though not with very steady legs, into the drawing room, where his bonny, blushing daughter, Catherine, and Mr Higgins stood whispering close together on the hearthrug. A sight to warm the heart of any doting father. And one can all too well imagine the thoughts that pass through the old fool's head. It's true, Miss Pratt. He was perhaps a rather weak and indulgent parent. But then she was a very sweet-tempered and pretty young girl. Very affectionate. And his son and heir, Nathaniel, was about to be married too, of course. And the thought of having both his children wedded happily and his beloved daughter not an hour's ride away at the White House in Barford. Well, as I said, you can see how the old fool's mind was working. Ah, uh, and she looks just like a poor dead mother used to when she was her age. Ah, oh. uh, so happy, so happy. 
so happy. And he's a good man. Sir Harry said so. And if my darling Catherine wants him, she shall have him. And she did. Eloped! What? Oh, uh, God, uh, can't be true. Oh, Catherine! Catherine! Where is she? Kate! Oh, no. Oh, dear. Oh, oh she's gone. Catherine! No, I feel like she's gone. Here. Oh, Look at this. Hmm? What's this? Oh, what's this madness she writes? I have eloped with the man of my heart, Mr. Higgins. Oh. What the devil does she think she's playing at for? Well, she, she was always a girl of spirit, Nat. You, you have to admit that it does take some courage to do what she's courage? done. Courage? Courage to fly in the face of all that's right and proper? Do you realise the slur this casts on our whole family? Well. At just such a time, too, as my own marriage. What will the baronet say to this, father, eh? Eh? Well, it, it is the act of great love, no. Nathaniel. An act of daring and such an act as I admire and am proud of. What? Have you gone completely mad? I don't care to be spoken to. And so the argument raged until at last Mr Nathaniel Hearn declared... From henceforth, my future wife and I shall have nothing whatsoever to do with my sister or oh. her confounded husband. Oh, just wait till you've seen him, Nat. He's an excuse for any girl. Only ask Sir Harry's opinion of him. Confound Sir Harry. So that a man sits his horse well, Sir Harry cares nothing about anything else. Who is this man? Where does he come from, eh? Uh, what, what are his means? Who are his family? Well, um, uh, he comes from the south. Sorry. Or oh, Somersetshire, I forget which. Uh, and he pays his way well and liberally. There's not a tradesman in Bath but says he cares no more for money than for water. He spends like a prince, Nat. I, I, I don't know who his family are, but he seals with a coat of arms, which may tell you if you want to know. And he goes regularly to the south to collect his rents from his estates there. Oh, Nat. Nat, if you would but be friendly, I should be as well pleased with Kitty's marriage as any father in the country. But Nathaniel continued to gloom and mutter, and he kept to his oath that he should never meet with his sister again. Indeed. Do you know, I heard Squire Hearn was obliged to steal away like a culprit whenever he went to visit the White House and make excuses for his absence on his return. But Mr and Mrs Hearn were the only people who did not visit at the White House, for Mr and Mrs Higgins took up where Mr Clavering left off and gave friendly dinners every week and were therefore most decidedly the more popular of the two couples in Barford. In fact, one could almost say they were universally popular. <laughs> Except <clears throat> there is always one to make adverse remarks <clears throat> and to draw ill-natured conclusions from very simple premises. You see, I do not hunt. So Mr Higgins' admirable writing did not call out her admiration. And, do you know, I saw him ahead of me, after we'd been riding a good hour, at least, and we were just coming down Shotcombe Hill, and, do you know, he set his horse straight at that wall at the bottom. Eight foot, it must be, at least. Straight at it he went, without flinching, and I watched him. He gave one flick of his whip, and that black mare of his, she soared over that wall like a bird. Oh, the courage of the man. Well, and the horse, too, I suppose. After all, credit where credit's due. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, where does a man learn to ride like that? And I do not drink. So the well-selected wines, so lavishly dispensed among his guests, could never mollify her opinion. <clears throat> uh, what did you say that wine was, old chap? Uh, 1822 Chateau Lafitte. There's only 25 bottles left in the whole country, and we just drank three of them. Oh, big head. You know how to live, Higgins. Well, <laughs> let's put it like this. I believe in drinking a better quality liquid than... Uh, than uh, what is passing from you so uh, <laughs> liberally as we speak. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if I were that ant down there, I'd rather drown in this stuff... What? Uh, than what comes from some bally ale drinker, eh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> quite right, old chap. <laughs> And I cannot bear comic songs or stories of daring do. In short, 
her approbation was impregnable, and it was these three secrets of popularity that constituted Mr. Higgins' great charm. Here, have some more brandy. Oh, sure. <laughs> Did I ever tell you, Harry, mm -hmm. about the time I bet my neighbour he couldn't stand on one leg in the middle of his dining table mm -hmm. and balance a quart of brandy on his head while singing non pu and dry without missing a note. <laughs> oh, easy. Well, well, easier than jumping the cropper gate in a thunderstorm, that's for sure. What? Are you on, then? Uh, uh, you're betting me now. Why not? Say two bottles of port that you can't stand on one leg in the middle of this dining table. <laughs> Is this a challenge I see before me? <laughs> well, out of my way. And balance this bottle of brandy on your head. Right. Oh, uh, just a minute. Uh, oh. Oops. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, now, uh, pass the brandy up. You've got it in your hand. Uh, uh, have I? Uh, ooh, so I have. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I place it on the head. Uh, ooh. Uh, ah, that's ooh. good. Uh, Hold it like that. Mm -hmm. Now, raise one knee very slowly. Ooh. Uh, uh, ooh, this is tricky. <laughs> Brilliant! Ha ha ha! Began, you've done it! Now, come along. Sing non pure and dry. Uh, uh, no, just remind me how that one goes again. Oh, never mind. I'll be generous. An aria from any well known opera of your choice. Off you go! Oh, oh uh, opera. Uh, oh, right. <clears throat> Quanta la mobile. Getting quite wobbly. <laughs> la 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 <laughs> oh. 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 And just to finish the story, old chap, my neighbour couldn't do it either. <laughs> oh, oh, I have to apologise about the brandy. Oh, no need. I made sure I caught that. Oh, oh. Well held. <laughs> but then uh, you always caught hold your liquor. Uh, I've always... <laughs> I mean, well, uh, how, how come you can? Uh, I, I mean, here am I, not fit to buckle my own shoes at the moment, and, and you... Are you accusing me of not drinking equal measures? Uh, oh, no. No, I, I know you have, because I've watched you do it. But, but how come you're able to hold your drink like that? Hmm? Well, you never know when you're going to need your wits about you, do you? Listen, I'm going to bet you now that you can't shoot a mark at 50 paces after drinking what you've drunk tonight. You're on. Really? All right. Yeah. Come on, then. Uh, now, I, I'm going to put this, uh, uh, this bottle on this wall. Oh, not the brandy again, Harry. Oh, don't worry. It's empty. <laughs> uh, now... I bet you can't hit that from, uh, uh, oh, no, 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 go further back. It's got to be 50 paces. Uh, uh, from here, right? From here? Yes, from there. Uh, you'll be glad. I can't see the bottle now. Yes, you can. Look, it's the silver streak above the wall. See? The moonlight's just hitting it. Oh, yes. Right. Well, go on, then. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, we haven't said what the bet's for. Ah, let's say two more bottles of port. And two bottles of that excellent brandy. Oh, done. Right. Uh, off you go. You know, this really is too easy. <laughs> I knew you couldn't do it. Who said I couldn't? What about I have to hit the bottle with one pistol and with the other, a bird that'll no doubt take to the air at the sound of the shot? What about that? Oh, impossible. Huh? <laughs> you, 
You're serious, aren't you? Never been more serious in my life. Well, all right. Make it four bottles of that brandy, then. It's a bet. Yeah. Cover your ears, Harry. By Jove! You did it! I, I can't believe it. I mean, where did you learn to shoot like that? <laughs> that is astounding. Shall we have some more tea, Miss Pratt? Oh, that would be most welcome, thank mm. you. I've been meaning to say, uh, did you ever notice how very strange his behaviour was after each of his visits to the South to collect his rents? No, I never remarked upon it. Well, I noticed he always shut himself up afterwards and drank enormously for days at a time. Though apparently no one else was admitted to these um, orgies. Is that so? Yes. And there was an incident about a month before the end. At Mr. Dudgeon's newly built house. What the deuce! What? Did you ever see Mr. Dudgeon's new gardens? Um, oh, they were exquisite. There was not a flower in them, but it was of the rarest species. Oh, yes. oh, yes. oh, I'm sorry about this old chap. And of all the places the poor fox could have chosen on the whole expanse of Wildbury Heath, he had to run right in at Mr. Dudgeon's gate. Mind you, if anyone could afford it, he could, being the only attorney in the district. Must apologise. Afraid Reynard's forgot his manners and gone to earth amongst Japitunias. <laughs> ah, it's Sir Harry, is it not? Of the Barford Hunt. It is. I am, and we are. Oh, I'm honoured, I'm sure. Please do feel free. Let me provide you with some refreshment. Maisie, we have guests. And of course, Mr. Dudgeon had to put a good face on it. Well, of course he did, in the presence of the aristocracy. Oh, bravo, chap! I could eat a horse and the rest of the hunt together. Now, come on, leave the hounds to dig him out. They're doing a grand job. And he even bore, without wincing, the entrance of all their dirty boots into his exquisitely carpeted rooms. Please, come in, all of you, again. Grand place you've got here, Dutcher. But perhaps his greatest claim to martyrdom was in allowing our dear friend Mr. Higgins to see over every beautifully clean room. I'm going to build a house myself, Dudgeon, and upon my word, I don't think I could take a better model than yours. Oh, my poor dwelling would be too small to afford any hints for such a house as you would wish to build, Mr Higgins. <laughs> not at all, not at all. Now, let me see. You have a uh, dining room, drawing room... Uh, four sitting rooms oh. and the bedrooms. Oh, couldn't impose on you to show me them, could I, old fellow? Uh, the bedrooms? Hmm. Uh, no, no, please, uh, come up. Delighted to show you, eh? Come on, Ranger. Hey, not you two, Fleet, Tarquin. Ha, <laughs> ha, <laughs> well. Oh, the man, Please, allow me. I confess, I took some pains in arranging the layout... And when the visiting party had sniffed into every nook and cranny of the upper story, then Mr. Dudgeon made, in my opinion, his gravest mistake. Hello. Not an eighth bedroom you've got here, is it, Dudgeon? Uh, no. No. Well, if you're not tired, Mr. Higgins... Not at all. Uh, then allow me to show you... My little sanctum. And do you know what was inside there, Mrs Gaskell? I've no idea. How is it that you do, Miss Pratt? Oh, the scullery maid. 
I know her mother, Mrs. Gaskell. Uh, Mr. Dudgeon's so-called sanctum was the room in which he kept numerous boxes and chests, all containing the most valuable items entrusted to him as attorney-in-law, and which he considered safer there than in his office in Barford, which, though locked, was nevertheless left every night. So you could say they are as safe as houses here, Mr. Higgins, sir. Allow me to show you the spring bolt here, which securely locks the window. You see, you lift the bar here and screw the nut here down as far as it'll go and then click it into place like so. And hey, presto, as safe as the Tower of London. <laughs> now, uh, this is my little secret. I invented this myself. If you press the lever here... It just springs up. Oh. See that? Oh. <laughs> Neat, eh? Ingenious. <laughs> you are a man of many talents, Dudgeon. Oh, of course, not everyone knows about the lever. Only my most intimate friends, Mr Higgins. Oh, you do me great honour, sir. And lo and behold... If not a fortnight after the gentleman of Barford had lunched there, Mr. Dudgeon's strong box, securely locked away in his sanctum with his foolproof lock on the window, is not stolen! Amazing! We've been burgled! The money, everything they entrusted to me, it's gone! It's gone! And so I understand, it became quite a standing joke between Mr. Higgins and Mr. Dudgeon whenever they met for Mr. Higgins to ask. Recommend a place of safety for my valuables, can you, Dudgeon? <laughs> Any nifty little levers you've got up your sleeve? <laughs> If that doesn't suggest something to you, Mrs. Gaskell, well, I don't know what will. Mm. But time is running on, and I must get back. Oh, <laughs> good afternoon, dear. Uh, my dear. In fact, it's as well that Miss Pratt has chosen to leave at such a moment, for this part of the tale becomes rather more serious. And Miss Pratt herself had a strange part to play in it. It happened a good two years after this time. That is, about seven years from when Mr Higgins had first been married. It was bitterly cold. One evening in February, when Mr Davis, a clerk who worked in Mr Dudgeon's office during the day, was sitting in the coffee room of the George Inn in the High Street reading an article in the gentleman's magazine that he'd found there. Indeed, he was making extracts from it, intending to answer it, though unable with his small income to purchase a copy, which is why he'd stayed rather later than he'd intended, and it was shortly after the clock had struck nine when the door opened, and who should come in but... Mr. Higgins, sir. You look quite blue with the cold. Here, here draw near the fire. Oh, thank you, Davis. Oh, it is a trifle cold tonight. You must have been out a while to get as cold as that, Mr. Higgins. Will you have a look at the newspaper, sir? It's the London one. And today's. There, uh, well, I, I'm finished. Well, I'll be... Any uh, account of the murder at Bath in that paper, is there? Has there been a murder at Bath? No, I haven't seen anything of it. Who was murdered? Oh, what a shocking, terrible murder. Terrible, terrible murder. I wonder what will become of the murderer. I can fancy... I... The red... Glowing centre of that fire. Look. See how infinitely distant it seems. And how the distance magnifies it into something awful and unquenchable. My dear sir, you're feverish. Oh. How you shake and shiver. Oh, no, I, I, I'm not feverish. It's the night which is so cold. The article. Oh, yes, sir. 
and for a time he talked with Mr. Davis about the article in the gentleman's magazine, for he was rather a reader himself and could take more interest in Mr. Davis's pursuits than most of the people at Barford. At length, it drew near to ten when the room was closed and Mr. Davis rose to go home to his lodgings. Oh, no, no, Davis, don't go. I want you here. We'll have a bottle of port together and that'll keep Saunders from turning us out. I want to talk to you about this murder. She was an old woman and he killed her sitting reading her Bible by her own fireside. Who do you mean, my dear sir? What is this murder you're so full of? Uh, no one has been murdered here. Oh, you fool, I tell you. It was in Bath. Uh, <clears throat> she lived in a small house in a quiet, old-fashioned street, she and her maid. People said she was a good old woman, but for all that, she hoarded and hoarded and never gave to the poor. Mr. Davis, it is wicked not to give to the poor. Wicked, wicked, is it not? It is, Mr. Higgins. Ah. Yeah. I always give to the poor. For once, I read in the Bible that charity covereth a multitude of sins. The wicked old woman never gave, but hoarded her money and saved and saved. Someone heard of it. I say she threw a temptation in his way, and God will punish her for it. And this man, or, or it might be a woman, who knows, this person heard also that she went to church in the mornings and her maid in the afternoons. And so, while the maid was at church, and the street and the house quite still, and the darkness of a winter afternoon coming on, she was nodding over the Bible. And that, mark you, is a sin and one that God will avenge sooner or later. And a step came in the dusk, up the stair, and that person I told you of stood in the room. At first he... First, it is supposed, for you understand all this is mere guesswork. Of course, of course. It is supposed that he asked her civilly enough to give him her money, or to tell him where it was. But the old miser defied him, and would not ask for mercy and give up her keys, even when he threatened her, but looked him in the face as if he'd been a baby. Oh God, Mr Davis, I once dreamt when I was a little innocent boy that I should commit a crime like this, and I wakened up crying, and my mother comforted me. That is the reason I tremble so now. That and the cold, for it is very, very cold. But did he murder the old lady? Uh, I beg your pardon, sir, but I'm interested by your story. Oh, yes. He cut her throat. And there she lies, yet in her quiet little parlour, with her face upturned and all ghastly white, in the middle of a pool of blood. Mr. Davis, this wine is no better than water. I must have some brandy. Saunders, let's have some brandy here. And Mr. Davis, who was horror-struck by the story, which seemed to have fascinated him as much as it had done his companion, kept his seat and forgot his original intention of getting home early to his warm bed. And have they got a clue to the merch? Here's your brandy, Mr. Higgins, sir. Evening, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Saunders. That'll be all. Oh. Very well, sir. Are there any clues left by the murderer? No. No clue whatever. They'll never be able to discover him. And I shouldn't wonder, Mr Davis. I shouldn't wonder if he repented after all and did bitter penance for his crime. And if so, will there be mercy for him at the last day? God knows. Oh, it's an awful story. I hardly like to leave this warm, light room and go out into the darkness after hearing it. But it must be done. Uh, I can only say that I hope and trust they will find out the murderer and hang him. If you'll take my advice, Mr Higgins, you'll have your bed warmed and drink a treacle posset, just the last thing. Oh, and uh, if you'll allow me, uh, I'll send you my answer to that article there before I send it up to the editor. But, 
Oh, yes. Well, good night to you, sir. Sleep well. Oh. Right. The next morning, Mr. Davis went to call on Miss Pratt, who's not very well, and by way of being agreeable and entertaining, he related to her all he had heard about the gruesome murder at Bath. And really, he made a very pretty story out of it, and interested Miss Pratt very much in the fate of the old lady, partly because of a similarity in their situations. For, I have to confide in you, Miss Pratt also privately hoards money, and has but one servant, and stops at home alone on Sunday afternoons to allow the maid to go to church. <coughs> Oh, and, oh, uh, where did you learn all this? Um, uh, yes. And not wishing to admit See, um, he'd been in the George Inn, especially not to Miss Pratt, I'm afraid he told a small fib. Oh, I, I remember now. From one of the chaps at work. Uh, and, and, and when did it all happen? I don't know uh, if he named the day... And yet I, I think it must have been on this very last Sunday. Ah, and uh, today is Wednesday. Oh, well, news travels fast. Yes. He thought it might have been in the London newspaper. Oh, that it could never be. Mm. <coughs> Where did he learn all about it? I don't know. Um, perhaps he uh, had a letter. I mean... Um, and in the way of small white lies, Mr. Davis became more and more entangled by his own fabrications and more and more uncomfortable. <coughs> yes, well, I shan't see you for some days. Uh, Godfrey Merton has asked me to go and stay with him and his sister, and I, I think it'll do me good. Besides these winter evenings <coughs> and these murderers at large in the country, I don't like living with only Peggy to call to in case of need. So Miss Pratt went to stay with her cousin, Mr Merton. He was an active magistrate and enjoyed his reputation as such. One day he came in, having just received his letters. Here's a thing, Jessie. There's a poor old lady at Bath had her throat cut last Sunday week. Oh. And I have a letter from the Home Office asking to lend them my very efficient aid, as they're pleased to call it, towards finding out the culprit. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, it seems he must have been thirsty and of a comfortable, jolly turn. For before going to his horrid work, he tapped a barrel of ginger wine that the old lady had set by, and he replaced the spigot with a torn envelope taken out of his pocket, as may be supposed. And this piece of envelope was found afterwards, see? There are only these letters on the outside. Something Inns, Esquire. Something Arford. Something Anford. Mm. Any ideas, old girl? Well, yes, I have. Hmm? I heard the story of the murder before I came here. Hmm. Hmm. And it seems to me perfectly obvious that something Arford, something Anford on the address there is Barford near Cranford. Well, what a thing. I think you're right. So you've either a murderer among you or some friend of a murderer. Oh. You've heard the story, you say? Oh, yes, just before I came away. From Mr Davis. Oh, but it can't be. A scrawny little chap like him. No, no, don't forget the name on the envelope here. Something Inns, Esquire. Oh, do you know anybody whose name ends in inns? <gasps> yes, I do. Really? Well, out with it, Jessie. You may be holding the secret of the murderer's identity. Uh, there is a Mr Higgins who lives in Bath. Higgins? What? Not that blustering fellow who ran away with Nathaniel Hearn's sister? Yes. Higgins? Oh, well, it's too horrible to think of. A member of the hunt. Kind old Squire Hearn's son-in-law. Oh, oh, come, let's think. Who else have you in Barford with names that end in inns? 
Well, uh, I can't think. Um, uh, there's Jackson and uh, Blenkinsop and Jones. <gasps> Cousin, one thing strikes me. I remember now. I heard Mr Higgins left early that weekend to go down south to collect his rents. Well, what need is there to add much more? It transpired with further investigation that Miss Pratt's suspicions had been well-founded all along. A gentleman, Mr Higgins was not, unless one attributes the gentleman of the highway with that title. His rents, which he collected so regularly in the South, were, like that of Gentleman Jim and Dick Turpin, gathered from poor, or rather rich, unfortunates on the roads. But having hit a patch of bad luck in one or two of his adventures, and hearing exaggerated accounts of the hoarded wealth of the old lady at Bath, he was led on from robbery to murder, for which he was duly arrested a short time later at home in the White House in Barford, before a stunned and disbelieving group of relatives gathered together over dinner. My darling Kate, my poor Kate. And one has to give it to him. He made a most dignified exit. I entrust her to your hands now, Father. Oh, my daughter. Look after her well. She's been a good wife to me. You know, it's strange. I, I always knew I'd be found out ever since that dream I had as a boy. I, God forgive me. God forgive me. <laughs> his poor wife took lodgings in Derby to be near him in his last awful moments. Oh, pray for me, Kate. Pray for me. And her old father, who now went with her everywhere, for he had abdicated his squireship in favour of his son Nathaniel, and was now her constant knight, her protector, her companion. He received her from her husband's last embrace, as she was led gently from the prison cell. Oh, my daughter. My dear daughter. And then... It was all over. For Mr Robinson Higgins was duly hanged for his crime in the October of that year, 1855. Oh, and just one last piece of gossip, supplied, of course, by Miss Pratt... There's a rumour that Mr Higgins's ill-gotten wealth is walled up in some unknown concealed chamber. And it so happens that the White House is to let again. I walked past and saw the sign myself not a month ago. So, if anyone should be interested to investigate this mystery and find out this hidden closet, I can furnish the exact address. <laughs>